How many of you saw the royal wedding yesterday with uh, Prince Harry and Meghan? Anybody? So I was just a few of us watched it. It was it was glorious. And as I was watching it, I was thinking how so many people, you know, wish that was their experience to have all of those resources at their hands and to have that kind of a start. And I want you to know this, that we are part of a royal priesthood. So when you look at that royal wedding and the beautiful couple, beautiful service, lifted, they lifted up Jesus in the service, we need to remember that we ourselves are part of a royal priesthood of Jesus. That we're part of a royal bloodline. And that bloodline goes all the way back to Jesus. So I want you to feel that right now, that you are important because you are connected to Jesus. You are highly favored. You are a child of God. You are a son or daughter of the Lord, and he loves you. And he is working his power towards you, and you may not even realize it. So this morning, my message is going to be in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15. So if you'll go with me there, just go ahead and open up the scripture. Father God, we thank you for your incredible love and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you are working all things together for good because we know that you love us and that we've been called according to your purpose. Lord, speak to us this morning so that we can hear your voice, so that we can receive the words of life, the words of the gospel, and be transformed by the renewing of our minds in Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In the movie Waking Ned Divine, a 10-year-old boy asked his interim pastor of his church, Do you ever see God? Not directly, said the pastor, though I do get revelations. Does your job pay well, inquires the boy. No, the rewards of my work are mostly spiritual. Then the pastor asked the boy, have you ever thought about a life of service to the church? Not really, said the boy. I don't want to work for someone I never see and who doesn't even pay minimum wage. An elderly couple, and this was in the L.A. Times not long ago, but a true story, L.A. couple, elderly couple, died in their apartment, and the investigators found that they eventually came out in the autopsies that they had died of severe malnutrition. But the investigators had found over $40,000 cash in paper bags hidden in their closet. How does that happen? Hetty Green, America's known as America's probably greatest miser. Let me tell you a little bit about what an incredible miser she was. When she died, she, her family inherited $100 million. She ate, ate cold oatmeal every day because she didn't want to pay the money to heat the water. Her son, who had a leg injury and needed doctor doctor care, needed uh, surgery, she went for a long time without getting a medical care because she was looking for a free clinic. Well, in the meantime, she took so long looking for the the free clinic that his leg had to be amputated. You know, when we hear of these stories, we, we, it's just astounding. How could this be? How could people have so much in terms of resources and have so little vision, to have so little understanding of what is available to them? 
And so I've been thinking about how this relates to Ephesians. Because I think the Apostle Paul in this letter, he's writing to Christians in the period of around 60 to 62 AD. But he's writing to Christians who were living in a city of incredible wealth. And yet they were in danger of something that we need to know about. Because I believe that we too, sitting right here this morning, we're in danger of what they were in danger of. And that is simply this. Spiritual malnutrition. When we have immeasurable resources and right at our fingertips all of the heavenly blessings of Jesus. That's what Paul wants you to know. That's what he wants the Ephesians to know. Every spiritual blessing, that's how he begins his letter, is yours in Christ. But there's a danger that you won't see those blessings, that you will become dulled down in your heart, dulled down in your mind, and you will simply not see all that belongs to you and all that is available to you in Jesus. So I'm writing this message to you knowing there may be some of us, if not all of us, that are in danger of spiritual malnutrition. So go with me to chapter 1, verses 15, and I would like us to read together so that we might see, and this is the title of my message, the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us. And I want to add the word now. Let's read together. For this reason, I too, Having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen. Just let that settle in your spirit. Take a moment to just close your eyes and take a breath. Breathe in the breath of God. Breathe in His Spirit. This is Pentecost Sunday. We are remembering and commemorating the day that the church began. The church was breathed into existence. And Peter preached that message and 3,000 people responded and they received Jesus and they received the Holy Spirit. And we have received this as our, our inheritance. It is part of God's great plan for us, for the church. So what I want to show you now are four prayers that Paul prays that we need to know and we need to learn how to pray them. We need to start activating our prayers for our family 
over our church family, for our coworkers, because these are powerful prayers. Paul learned these prayers by revelation from God. And he wanted the Ephesians to know how to pray in the present darkness that they were living in. But these prayers will also help us. So I want you first to look at verse 17. Verse 17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom. That's a prayer. A spirit of wisdom and revelation. In short, all revelatory gifts of the Holy Spirit that have been given to the church, they all come about as a result of the revelation and the wisdom that we receive from Jesus. And that's what the church, we need that. We need the wisdom and revelation from God in the knowledge of Jesus. Otherwise, we won't even understand all that is ours. We won't understand our inheritance. And God forbid that we're ignorant towards the things of God. That's a problem in our country. It's a problem in the church that there are some people even today that are ignorant towards the things of God. So many of us, we have dozens of Bibles in our, house, in our homes, but so many times we don't understand the truths that are in them. So what this prayer shows us is that when you start praying in this way, Lord, I pray for the wisdom and the revelation of your spirit to be made known to my children. Something really powerful is going to happen. And I want to share with you now why three things will happen. Number one, we will experience and know the greatness of God's plan. That God has a plan for you. He has a plan for our graduates. But not only them, for every one of us. And his plans are good. The scripture, Pastor, that you quoted earlier from Jeremiah 29, 11, we need to own that. We need to have that living inside of us every day. We need to wake up in the morning and say, God, I know you have a great plan for me. God, I know you have a great plan for our church. God, how about this one? I know you have a great plan for our nation. And I know that that's all, not always an easy prayer to pray. That's why we need what, pray, what Paul prayed next. It's the enlightening of our hearts. So let's go to that scripture now in verse 18. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So the first thing is that our spiritual eyes must be opened. What Paul is implying here and what we know from historical records is that Ephesus was a place that your eyes could become darkened. There was a temple there. And Pastor, you alluded to this last week, the temple of Artemis. This was known all over the world at that time. People traveled there from other nations. It was, it was big. And what comes with these types of entities and these types of organizations and, and religions is demonic power, demonic darkness, where people, you wake up in the morning and the darkness can be so thick that you can't see reality. It looks like reality. It looks like this is what really is real, but it's not. It's all a lie. What is real, what is true, what is sometimes hidden, the mystery of Christ himself, we only can see that mystery when we see with the eyes that are enlightened by the Holy Spirit. 
This is why, beloved, you and I, we have to know how to pray for the church. We have to know how to pray for our neighbor. We've got to know how to pray for, the, for our own children. So pray this prayer. Pray that your own eyes will be enlightened so that you can see two things. Number one, you must see the hope of your calling. Why? Why do I need to see the hope of my calling? Why do I need to know about my calling? Because you have a universal calling from God. I'm not talking about your calling as a teacher, your calling as a, as a medical doctor. I'm not talking about your calling in the work, whatever your work is. That's important. But that's a specific calling that God will sometimes change. I myself, a year and a half ago, I never, I never knew that I was going to become executive pastor. That was not in my plans. But what I discovered as we merged two churches and I began to take on that role, I realized something I really needed to understand on a much deeper level, that my calling is not in any particular specific vocation or work because it will change. Has anyone experienced this? Some of you that are younger, you maybe haven't experienced this yet, but it, it's coming. And what you will need to discover is that there's something greater that's going to hold you and anchor you, and it's called your universal calling in Christ. And you begin to see that it doesn't really matter what you're doing or what kind of work you're doing. What really matters is your heavenly calling in Jesus. Because that calling will move you and keep moving you. You're not going to get bored with life. You're not going to become dulled down in your mind about what true reality is. You're going to see reality. Because you're in touch with the calling of God. That's what God wants for all of us today. He wants you to get back in touch with your heavenly calling. Secondly, he wants us to know the riches, our heavenly riches in Jesus' inheritance in the saints. What I want to explain here is that if we don't see our inheritance in Jesus, we won't see the people around us that are such treasures. We become dulled and dumbed down in our spiritual senses and we don't see the people God has placed around us who are created in God's image. These people have value. They have resources that we don't even understand. And so many times we just don't even recognize them. You may be sitting here this morning and you feel like that. You feel like, wow, you know, I've been in this church, but I don't really feel like that people have recognized me. I don't feel like that people really see my value. We want to. That's the heart cry here. We want to because we want to see Jesus. And if we start seeing Jesus, then we'll start seeing each other. See, that's how the church grows. That's how we recognize one another. We recognize this incredible value that we've been given because now we're realizing that the value that we hold in this world is not material wealth. It's not an, the abundance of our possessions, is it? It's not all the stuff we can accumulate. What is it? It's the riches of the glory of God in the inheritance of Jesus in the saints. And that's why, friends, when we talk about our life group, you talked about your life group, Pastor Brian. 
We love our life group. We love it. The people in our life group are just, so, they're treasures of God to us. And when we go to that group, we know that we're loved. We know that we're accepted. We know that there's people who are praying for us. But I got to tell you something. Sometimes what really means a lot to me is just knowing that I'm valued. That there are people in that group who really see my value. So this morning, I want us to think about the greatness of God's plan. Are you in touch with the greatness of God's plan for your life? And we're going to pray at the end of my message that you can become, that this will actually happen. And we're going to pray that you will even come forward, that this will be a, a posturing for you of saying, hey, I've been kind of dulled down in my senses, but now I need to become awakened so that I can see God's plan. Number two is that Paul is preaching and teaching about the greatness of God's power. We need to experience God's power, but when we live in a world of secular humanism that's rising, what happens is that a deadening of our hearts can take place. And you'll find this actually laid out scripturally in chapter 4, where Paul begins to talk about how you walk out the life of Jesus in your life. And he goes in, he talks about the challenge for the Ephesians, and he starts talking about all of these different aspects of what could deaden their hearts, what could dull their spiritual senses and keep them from seeing spiritual reality. And so he begins to speak to them about being seeing the greatness of God's power. Because if we don't see and experience his power, we'll be dulled down in our senses and we won't recognize the Lord. So I want you to think about Luke chapter 24, verses 13. Remember the disciples on their walk to Emmaus after Jesus was raised from the dead? These disciples, they knew that, had heard that Jesus was risen from the dead. But what happened to them is they were on that seven-mile journey to Emmaus. Jesus came alongside them in his resurrected body. And you want to know something astounding? They didn't recognize him. How can this be? How could Jesus in his resurrected body, how could you not recognize that is the Lord? Because they were sad. Because they were grieving. Because they were in, dis in, a, in a sense of loss in their life. And we can relate to that. Because when you are in a time of loss and when you're in a time of grief, it can cloud your mind so that you don't see the glory of God, so that you're not recognizing his greatness. And I look at that passage, Luke 24, verses 31, and I think about what changed, what changed for them. What opened their eyes? It was when they stopped and said to Jesus, who they didn't know was Jesus, come into our house and stay a while and eat with us. And while they were breaking bread with Jesus, beloved, this is the importance of communion. When we take communion and when we commune with Christ, when we break bread with him, when even when our senses have been dulled and we do not recognize him, Jesus will reveal himself to you. And you will see Jesus. And they saw him and they said, it's you. And he vanished. What I'm saying to you today is that we need to see the surpassing greatness of Jesus' power in a world and sometimes in a church that's lost sight of his power. In other words, I don't feel his power. I sing about his power. I pray about his power. I declare about his power. 
But sometimes in my life, I don't feel his power. Sometimes I feel absolutely weak. I feel like nothing's happening. I feel like that there's nothing taking place. Does any of one of you ever feel that way? Listen, that is not you alone. That is behind that is a spirit. That's why when you get to the, uh, the end of Ephesians, Paul brings in this whole chapter in chapter 6 about the spiritual forces of darkness that are real, that are all around us, that are contributing towards sometimes you're not being able to see truth to behold spiritual truth. And we need to be aware of it so that we're not blinded by it, so that we're not dulled down in our senses. And this is how we're going to keep from getting dulled down in our senses. First of all, it's going to be according to God's working of the strength of his might. And what Paul does here is he uses several different synonyms all in a row, so he wants us to understand something about the power of God. Four Greek words. Number one, dunamis. You know what that means, right? It's, it's all about Pentecost. The power of God came upon the church. The Holy Spirit came upon the early believers. 120 of them were in the upper room. They were in prayer. And the Holy Spirit came upon them in fire. And they experienced God's power. Energia. That's where we get the word from the, uh, in the English word energy. You know, like the energizer bunny. Where do you get energy? Not from energy bars. That's not the spiritual energy. We're talking about spiritual energy that's from God's spirit. You may not have an energy bar. And that's when we need to tap into the raw power of God. We need to stop being so dependent on all of these other things and realize that the one thing that we need is the power of God. Kratos, meaning strength. Our strength comes from the Lord. And the last word is iskus, means the Lord's might. Why would Paul use these words all in a row? Because he wanted them to understand that this power is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And if you forget that, if, if your senses become dulled down where you have forgotten what kind of power is available to you now, not in the kingdom to come, but the power of God now, then you may lose sight of God's power. There was a time that I struggled, probably more than any other time in my life, to really understand God's power. It was a d very difficult time. And I was in ninth grade in high school. And one of my good friends named Sherry, have you ever known a tomboy? Sherry was a tomboy. She was awesome. She liked all the things that I liked. Guns, hunting, outdoors, farming. We were in the Future Farmers of America Club together. And Sherry, she, one day they came by the grocery store. That's what we called the supermarket back in Oklahoma. And because that's where I worked and I had a job there. And they want, my friends came by one day and they wanted to, me to go hunting with them and Sherry was with them. I wanted to go so bad. A little bit later they had gone out to a field nearby and didn't find anything, so they made their way back to the house. And as they were getting out of the truck, Sammy, one of my friends, not being careful, somehow his gun went off. 
and that shotgun fired right through the cab of the truck and took the life of Sherry. Beautiful tomboy Sherry. And Sherry was gone. She left us that day. And what unfolded for me was one of the most difficult things I've ever walked through in my life because I didn't know God very well. And that's where some of you are today. You're just getting to know God. And, 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 and some, some of us, in truth, you may not really have experienced his power. And for me, what was going on in my life at that time was I just couldn't really see. I hadn't experienced God's power. It didn't seem like God was that real. And when something that bad happens, and I mean, bad things happen. Look at the shootings that have been going on and escalating in our country. The, the violence that's escalating. All of these things, they have a way of working in us to dull down our senses and our ability to recognize Jesus. And that's what happened to me. I went into a, a very dark period there, and my friends went into deep depression. And we went to the funeral, the, the school. The, the funeral was about two miles from, the, from our high school. And they just released who, whatever kids wanted to go to the funeral. They just released us and let us walk. And while walking through down the road to get there, I had time to really think about this with my friends, and, and I started really thinking about what is the purpose of life? You know, is God real? It seems so hopeless. Sherry is gone forever. How we ever, what, how, why did this happen? Then looking at my friend Sammy, I, I felt so badly for him because now he had to live the rest of his life with the tragedy of what he the, what he had done. And at the funeral, they, there was a minister there, and he sang this song, You'll Never Walk Alone, from the drama, The Carousel. Have you heard it? It's a beautiful, beautiful song. But in that song, it talks about moving from hopelessness to seeing hope in God. And when we experience that hope, that living hope, it becomes real. And so real that we begin to see spiritual reality. We begin to see what is real. And that we're not alone. That we will never, ever walk alone. And this week I got on, to, uh, looked up on YouTube some different people that sing, have sung that song. I mean, I listened to Elvis, and he did a good job. But actually, I found some others that I liked a lot better. And one of them was Susan Boyle. And when Susan sang it, something, something was really resonated much stronger than Elvis. And I began to look into a little bit about Susan's life. And you, you, I don't know if you know much about Susan, but she became famous overnight by, by winning on America's Got Talent. And a phenomenal voice like you've never heard. And what people don't know is that Susan Boyle, at a, at a young age, even as a child, she was um, diagnosed with brain damage. They really thought that she was brain damaged from birth, that there was something wrong with her. And so can you imagine how she was bullied all of her life by other kids and all of the, the terrible things that people would say to her? And at 47 years of age, she, she just became famous. But that's not the whole story. She lost her mother and her father about that time. She lost her, her siblings, died, and I mean just a whole string of losses occurred. And she vanished, really. She disappeared from the public, still recording, still doing some of those things. But what really got my attention in this is thinking about her life and what happened to what has happened to her. 
And what happens when a person loses hope? Their heart becomes darkened by the present darkness in the world. So what we need is to see and experience his power, but we also need to experience the greatness of God's son. Because without his son, it doesn't matter what song you sing, you're not going to have hope. If we have Jesus and we see Jesus, no matter what we walk through, no matter what difficulties we go through, we will have hope. And I want to just share from my heart right now. What the church needs most of right now is hope. What I've been going through in my life in this last season has been time, a time of different transitions. Transitioning, finishing up uh, my studies for my doctorate. That was, that was one big transition. And then now we've been going through a transition. We went through a huge transition with... Um, with the Springs Church. That was, there was a lot that was involved in that. And then we've also been going through a transition with our daughter, Shiloh, who's going to be graduating this week. She was up here earlier. And so I've been... It's really messed me up. <laughs> I will admit, I, I've been having some major crying spells that I don't have any control of just suddenly start weeping at the drop of a hat, a memory, a thought. Hearing Shiloh play the piano. And, I mean, it's been really difficult. Some of you are like, oh, really? Yeah. Because I think that one of the things that we're dealing with is it's not just that I'm trying to transition in graduating my daughter and, and sending her off to college, but there's something even bigger than that that's going on that's really caused some grief in me on a fundamental level that I'm not really sure that I understand. But I can tell you this, that in this last season that I've been in, I've, been, I've had some time to really understand more about that and to begin to see some of the grief, the level of grief that I've been carrying about our nation, the grief that, that, that has been deep inside of me that I didn't fully understand or even know about, about the state of the church. I think there's grief that I've been carrying as I've looked at my own life. It has been so painful as I've at times seen what powerlessness I have in my own life. At times... It seems as if I'm, there's no power in me at all to change, let alone change my family or change my neighborhood or change the church or change a nation. Are you kidding? And that's when I need to remember. That's when I need to realize that there's something some spiritual forces of darkness that I might not fully understand that are waging war against my soul, yeah. trying to dull me down, trying to deaden my heart, trying to give me a darkened heart so that I can't see spiritual reality. And I want you to know something. All of us will go through those times. You're going to go through times and seasons when it seems as if your heart has become darkened. And in those times, you'll be tempted to just fill up your life with all types of escapism. You know what escapism is, right? It's all of the things that we employ and embrace in our culture to try to deaden the pain. It's like wanting drugs but not wanting drugs. It's a different kind of drug. But here's the thing. If you keep going down that path, brother and sister in Christ, you're going to darken your heart. 
and you will fail to recognize Jesus. So what have we got to do? We got to start praying like the church knows how to pray. We got to pray the prayers of Paul. Are you praying the prayers of Paul? Start praying this prayer, Lord, open the eyes of the hearts of this generation. Enlighten their hearts so that they can see the truth. I was watching the wedding last night, actually. I didn't get a chance to watch it until around 11. And you know, it really, really gripped me is that, you know, this, this powerful man of God gave this incredible sermon. And they were panning with the, with the cameras at the, all the famous people that were sitting there, George Clooney, um, I'm trying to think of Eric Clapton, or not Eric Clapton, John, Elton John, sorry, a little bit of dyslexia there. Elton John, and I saw such deadness. Oh, it was alarming. I saw people just completely shut off, not connected, not. And yet, at the same time, there's this glorious, powerful man of God preaching the gospel right there at the wedding. They even caught Prince Harry after the sermon ended say, wow. Listen, what, what's going on there? But I saw some people that were listening. And that's what we've got to keep looking towards, is are the people that are listening to God, that are listening and paying attention. Right now, the most important thing you can do in your life is pay attention to God. Amen. Pay attention to his word. Pay attention to the prayers that Paul prayed. Pay attention to the preaching of the messages that the church is preaching. Pay attention to everything that God is speaking to you. Amen. Because he wants you to what? He wants you to see the greatness of the power of God. Amen. That's at work in you. Now, not when you go to heaven, but what's working in you now. Yeah. That's what we need to get a hold of. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same power that seated him at the right hand of the heavenly father. It's the same power that seats us in Christ in heavenly places. It's the same power that put all things under his feet. Come on, someone stomp your feet right now. Jesus has given you power and authority through his name. He is connected to you. But your part is you must embrace him. And he has given you power of his might that works through the church, his body. Never forget this, beloved. His body the fullness of him who fills all in all. Stop treating your spiritual resources like Hetty Green, who left this world with, left behind a hundred million dollars. But was a miser in the spiritual things of God. Stop starving yourself from the immense resources that are available to you in Jesus. Start embracing the immense power of God that is now available. Start basking in the light of Christ's assurance of the cross. Cast off that heart of darkening. Start putting your faith and hope in Jesus. Would you please stand? I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. I'm actually going to have us sing a closing song, and then we're going to pray this prayer together. A participatory prayer so that we can actually pray 
the prayers of Paul right here, right now, today, and to see a spiritual transformation take place.